I'm Doug, stand-up physicist, sitting down to give a whiteboard talk about the map of physics. This was done by the Domain of Science channel uh, fellow. I highly recommend that you stop watching my video and watch this one if you haven't already. Or maybe even watch it again. <laughs> maybe even spend the 15 bucks or so to get the actual map so that whatever physics topics come up comes up, you can say, oh, that's right over here, or that's over there. Okay? Gives you an overall view of what is going on in the subject. I think he did a really wonderful job. But that doesn't mean it's perfect. <laughs> okay? So early on in that video, he talked about the simple view where you've got classical physics, you've got relativity, and you have quantum mechanics. Hmm. Nice three separate areas. Great. And then further on, he said, well, you know, the bedrock of physics is mathematics. Okay. Great. So we'll do that right there. And... That raises a question. Okay, if mathematics is underlying this subject, then what mathematically makes something classical physics? What mathematically makes something relativistic? What mathematically makes something about quantum mechanics? It should be a nice, simple, direct answer, right? Now, I think most physicists would say that classical physics is kind of the physics of normal, everyday stuff around you. Relativity is the physics of going fast. And quantum mechanics is about small stuff. Which is fine for a physicist. <laughs> but it, that has no math content. You can't look at an equation and say, that's small stuff. <laughs> or that's fast stuff. Or that's kind of ordinary stuff. All right? So what I'm going to do in this video is give you some math tools to use to say, oh, it doesn't matter what equation you gave me, now that I've written it out, I know what it, it's dealing with. Okay? That's the goal. Great. So, what's my approach going to be? Well, it's different than most. Okay? I must confess I have an odd obsession of trying to write physics equations not as a vector space over some mathematical field, but instead to use a type of number called a quaternion. Now you know real numbers. Uh, they're pretty ordinary. Hopefully you've heard about complex numbers, which are pairs of numbers that can be added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided. And maybe you have or have not heard about a quaternion, which has a scalar, which I think of as kind of like a time, and uh, three imaginary numbers, which I think about as space. And what I've done for many a year <laughs> has been to write standard physics equations as quaternions. And two things happen out of this process. One is that you get the regular result that's no different. But oftentimes there are extra terms that you kind of didn't know were there. I think they're well formed. And if they're well formed, nature probably puts them to work. Uh, puts them to use, okay? So that's been my hobby. And that hobby, I think, gives me a way of giving you a math explanation of, these, uh, of this division of areas of physics. And right off the bat, I'm going to be a little different than the domain of science. Okay, so we had classical. The stuff of Newton. And now we're going to put a nice, big, solid dividing line down here. And we're going to put relativistic. And by that, he covers both special relativity and general relativity. And now quantum mechanics? Well, I'm going to disagree with his Venn diagram. They're not three separate subjects. Instead, there's an overlap. So I'm going to actually put a dashed line here. And I'm going to put down here quantum mechanics. And the reason I do that is because there is classical quantum mechanics and there is relativistic 
quantum mechanics. And there is also not quantum mechanics. Okay? Because certainly what Newton did <laughs> didn't have any quantum mechanics. Uh, special relativity can work in a, a, a kind of quote-unquote uh, classic, well, can work in a non-quantum mechanic con uh, context and can work in a quantum mechanical context, both of them. Okay, so that's why I think it's more of an overlay. All right, so what is classical physics then? Well, Sir Isaac Newton himself said F equals MA. Nice, simple, succinct. We like that, very direct. But I'm kind of like a Python programmer who's like likes things to be like a more explicit. That's one of the nice things about working with quaternions is you don't say, well, I'm going to only talk about time. You always, always have to say, here's what I'm saying about time, and here's what I'm saying about space. Here's what I'm just saying about space, here's what I'm saying about time. You always have to make a more complete statement. So we're going to do that with MA. Oh, well, not really. We're going to say, what is, what, what is force again? It is a change in momentum. A change in time of momentum. So if we define it that way, we have to have a change in time operator. And what kind of space operator do you have? None. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put zero. Okay, and I, okay, I, I do a, a shortcuts of my own. That should be zero, 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 but I'm just going to, I usually bunch the space part together. All right. Then Momentum is mass times velocity, or mass times a time change of spatial position. A, a mass times the time change of position. Oh, look at that. We, and right now, I'll tell you, this is what classical physics expressions look like. They've got zeros, <laughs> okay? That's not very difficult to, uh, to use. Uh, you know, it's like, that's the rule? You write things out as quaternions with the time and space uh, part always there, and then if you got zeros, you got a classical expression. That's it. <laughs> I taught this uh, to my mother-in-law. See, she gets it. <laughs> She doesn't get much physics, but that's an easy rule to apply. Oh, I should say, it does generalize a little bit, because if I made these things omegas, then I would get into the crazy world where you had, uh, you know, the Coriolis force and, you know, the Smith uh, kind of forces and all that, that kind of crazy things. So it can be, you can have constants in there. Uh, it's just that you're treating the time operator or whatever, differently from the space. Once you do that, even one time, that is when you say this is a classical expression. All right, so if I apply the product rule of calculus to this, what I get is mass times the second time derivative of spatial location plus dm dt uh, dr dt, velocity. All right. Now, in the past, I have made a mistake <laughs> when I discussed this. Um, oh, hold on. This, this, this term, let's just make things nice and clear. This is ma. And this term is mystery. That's the wonderful thing, I think, of write, writing expressions as quaternions. This is a well-formed expression that, as far as I know, is used for no physics, which really seems remarkable to me. Because <laughs> nature, like, uses every valid equation she gets her hands on, okay? Uh, I have made it a, a mistake in the past of this, of, of, of bringing up the word rocket in this context. <laughs> Rockets have two velocities, one for the rocket, the other for the fuel. Uh, this is not that, that thing. This is the product rule 
uh, force that's saying, hey, not only can things go faster uh, or point in a different direction, but you should also consider changes in where mass is speeding along. And we still have some huge <laughs> mysteries in physics, particularly dealing with the force of gravity in a classical context. Uh, three I can think of are like the rotation profile of galaxies. Uh, doesn't work. <laughs> the uh, Big Bang model uh, has got two huge problems. One being that it's mathematically stable, and the second is that they all agree on the same velocity even though they're too far apart to reach agreement. And uh, finally, there is the, uh, the acceleration of the universe now, even though gravity is supposed to be slowing things down. <laughs> these, are, these are strange birds, okay? And uh, this isn't really relevant to this talk so much, uh, but I, I love that product rule term, and you know, I dream that maybe someday it'll solve a huge problem instead of just being this math artifact that just shows up uh, when I write Newton's work uh, using quaternions. Okay, so that says that uh, if I'm going to go relativistic, I got to treat everybody as equal. Okay, so let's do that sort of thing. Uh, if we do that, then we start with a, um, let's take a time operator. Let's actually make these guys partials. And uh, let's do a space operator. Okay. And let's try and keep things simple. Uh, we'll have it act on a potential, a four potential. Should put little arrows over that. And when we do this, we use the rule for uh, multiplying uh, quaternions together, which is first minus last for for the first term, and then for the three three other parts, it's outie any cross product. So we go d phi dt, those are the first, minus the divergence of a. And then Audi is dA dt uh, plus grad phi plus the curl of a. Now, these should look familiar, okay? Because this is the electric field of electromagnetic theory. This is the magnetic field. And this is a gauge term. So this is <laughs> just remarkable, people. I wasn't trying to do electromagnetic theory, okay? I was just saying, take the simplest four derivative of the simplest four potential and look what falls out. <laughs> Uh, some very relativistic physics uh, falls out because light, as we know, uh, oh, the gauge got to be zero, so you got to knock that that guy out, which is easy enough to do algebraically. And then, you, you know, once you knock out the gauge, you can know, you know, pick the gauge that you want. It doesn't matter. You're you're knocking it out, and that I think is a valid description of the electric and the magnetic field algebraically. Okay. And, of course, that goes at the speed of light. <laughs> so it sounds very, very germane. Okay, very relativistic. But there's really a division in the re relativity uh, domain. And that would be between what I call speedy, speedy relativity, speedy R, or SR, special relativity, And what I call gravity relativity. GR. All right. Now, the way we understand those today, special relativity is kind of a symmetry that equations have to uh, respect. It's just an algebra thing. There aren't particles that are associated with the special rel with special relativity per se, it's like every particle has to obey uh, the, the the rules of the r the rules of causality essentially. Gra uh, general relativity, Einstein's theory, is a field theory. 
so you have a Lagrangian, you do the variation on that thing with the metric tensor, and you end up with field equations that are next to impossible to solve. Um, and the overlap between them is that general relativity is really the big important thing. And it's just like when you get into empty space, then general relativity goes to look just like special relativity. Or if you're in a huge gravity field and somebody else is next to you, then it kind of looks like special relativity is in play. So let, let, actually, let me explain this part. The whole relativity thing is about having two observers. We'll say uh, observer orange, and we'll do observer green. Great. And what happens is something explodes. So something goes boom, and something else explodes. Okay. And what they do is both of these observers, well, observe, <laughs> and they measure a dt, a change in time, and there's a dr. And I must say, I, I, I must admit something. I, I'm writing these as little differential elements, so so we have to think about these things blowing up really close to one another, and then you have to worry about what do you mean by really close, and I probably am not the person who's, who's ever going to, like, bring this to a uh, professional um, context and, and sell the idea, but uh, I can explain it to my level of precision, as it were. Well, let's just square this, all right? We could square this, and we do the rule, okay? <laughs> it's the first minus the last, dt squared minus dr squared. And then uh, Audi any cross. So that would be, let me just get rid of this. That would be Audi 2 dt dr. And since r points in the r direction, uh, there is no cross. All right, and that's it. Okay, now, Special relativity is about two observers agreeing to this value. This is called the Lorentz invariant interval of special relativity. And if two observers happen to agree to that, then we can say that they have an inertial relationship to each other, which means that one's traveling at a constant velocity relative to the other person. So I think of this as being speedy physics, that side. But special relativity to me has three legs to it. There's the parts that you agree on. There's the parts you disagree on. And then there are rules for transforming between these two. And only when you have these three together do you have complete understanding. So everybody might emphasize, say, the interval in some context and not mention the things that change. Or sometimes they talk about the things that change and they don't talk about the things that don't change, the things that they agree on. But a complete answer, all three. So they're going to agree to the interval and they're going to disagree about that other thing. <laughs> but what is that other thing? And here again, it's crazy. That other thing doesn't have a name. Okay, and I came up with one. Uh, I call it space times time because it's space times time. All right. So they agree about the interval. They disagree about the space times time. And this just leads to a natural question. What happens when two different observers, who knows what they're doing, <laughs> agree about their space times time and disagree about their interval. Well, the only place I know where people disagree about intervals is if people are in different locations in a gravitational field. You know, if you go up in a gravitational field, you're going to say, oh, gravity isn't such a big deal. Uh, my heart can rate, r r beat a little faster. And, and my ruler gets a little bigger. Those are actually opposite effects. And they approximately cancel in general relativity. And so it became my hypothesis that if two people agree 
about their space times time, that that will explain how gravity works. And so far, why don't we say I haven't convinced anybody of this, <laughs> okay? I, I, it's going to be darn difficult for me to uh, formalize how I dis have to discuss this for professionals to buy on. Okay, it just that's just the facts. Uh, but I can show, it's on this t-shirt, okay? This is the light cone of special relativity, and everybody absolutely agrees about that, the dark, uh, and it means that, you know, if you go on these hyperboles, it just means that's a real value that you're agreeing on, but you're going at different speeds. And if you rotate that by 45 degrees, you end up with this thing, where we have hyperboles again, most excellent. But these are imaginary values, and I'm saying that I think it just means that you're kind of higher up or lower down in a gravitational field. So that's my take on, on, on how gravity might work. So what is quantum mechanics about, at least algebraically? Well, I think it's about dealing correctly with almost nothing the good old vacuum, and not quite the vacuum. So that would be dealing with zero. So the idea is that you've got to get zero and things near zero. Oh, and not have anything negative. <laughs> okay. How are you going to do that? Well, with quaternions, there's like one answer you deal with the norm of a quaternion. And that means you've got some function, who cares what it is, you, you take its conjugate, you multiply it by itself, and this is going to be what we call positive definite. It's going to be of the form A zero. Okay? So A has got to be positive. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the algebra uh, that, that it works out. And I think if you are, have this form where in order to connect your results to what's seen in experiment, that you must take the norm, you must take the conjugate, multiply it by itself, and get this value to connect it to experiment, that's when you're doing quantum mechanics. And when you're not taking the norm, you're not doing quantum mechanics. That's why Newton wasn't doing quantum mechanics. <laughs> Special relativity is not doing quantum mechanics. Um, dealing with gravity, not quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, so I think that's the whole story. But what about classical versus quantum? Is there a situation where sometimes you have some zeros about or constants and sometimes not? Well, yeah, there is. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with the Schrodinger uh, equation. And I like to make everything kind of dimensionless, so I'm going to put some constants over here. Um, and you've got an operator, h uh, d by dt. Great. And an h bar c del. And you go, well, that's relativistic, isn't it? <laughs> so far. <laughs> but you've got to take another operator, and this guy's got a 1. Ah, that's a constant. And you've got an h bar del over 2m. And this is yet another case where physicists want the smallest thing they can, they can work with productively, um, which, of course, is the Schrodinger equation. But this sort of thing creates three other derivatives kind of in the phase. And apparently you can do a heck of a lot of physics without dealing directly with the phase. But I, I have a feeling that sometime in the future, quote unquote, <laughs> people will make something out of that. But until then, what you do is you take this whole thing and uh, repeat it. Uh, so I'm going to go plus. I'm not going to write this out because it just takes too much effort. Um, but it's those those two terms again. And then you take the conjugate of that. 
and that will wipe out the, the like the mixed time the space sort of derivative that's one of them this is another one that would go into the phased stuff but apparently you can do a lot of productive physics without it um, now this whole th operator thing acts on a wave function and that happens to equal um, again my my constant sort of thing um, a scalar potential with no vector potential acting on phi all right so if you now multiply this out realizing you're wiping out the uh, the, the vector kind of term then you get G H bar C5 you get H D by DT plus H bar squared to M del squared zero because we're writing it out I, um, I'm going to bring this thing over um, so so this is going to go minus V zero all this acting on this wave function and that is the Schrodinger equation uh, but it's not yet quantum mechanical is it <laughs> so let me just take this whole darn thing let me define this as as that and in order to get experimental uh, confirmation of this this relation you find your solutions and you have to then take the norm of this sort of thing and that equals you know boom great and that's when you say ah we're doing quantum mechanics all right so what would relativistic quantum mechanics have well um here's a derivation i do um which is very similar to the klein gordon equation except it's off by a sign <laughs> which means my expression is wrong I, I i i'm doing this one just because uh it's kind of super easy to explain and um it'll be interesting to hear you know professionals if we can get them uh to comment on this uh the sign issue uh okay so um let's start with something completely kind of uh relativistic uh the energy momentum relation where what we do is we square it up so that equals e squared minus p squared and we get this 2ep term and this turns out to be the mass squared all right great so to take a relativistic kind of expression and kind of put it in the domain of uh, quantum mechanics you kind of substitute operators in for these things that are normally thought of as just like numbers so um, I'm gonna uh, put in here oh oh yeah my units um, that guess that would be a G H bar C5 which turns out to have units of time squared and I'm going to go uh, D by DT that has units of per time and then we go C del units of per time squared acting on a wave function oh I should also say these wave functions today are always complex valued and it's one of these things that's like too big for me to ever imagine doing but I imagine a day <laughs> when quaternions could be uh, quaternion valued away functions could could um, be used because they actually have complex values as a formal subgroup so if you really insist on on staying with complex value you can take the quaternions and just say well, I'm restricting it to a place where you know the imaginary part doesn't move around a lot uh, any and so uh, go ahead and, and do that so at least at the beginning you can use just quaternions constricted uh, to kind of a complex um, uh, domain all right anyway 
So we have this thing acting twice on, on this wave function, and that's going to equal, uh, well, this is going to be uh, G H bar C, which has units of one over mass squared. Uh, so M, M squared, and then we have a gamma, gamma beta, and squared acting on a wave function. Great. So now let's multiply this whole thing out, and we, of course, get our constants. And we get our mixed derivative term, which absolutely nobody ever uses, as far as I can tell. Let's put a C in there. Acting on the wave function. And I'm going to bring these guys over here. So this is a minus. Great. Uh, and now this is gamma squared minus gamma squared beta squared, which turns out to be unity. And then 2 gamma beta squared. Well, actually, let, so I can take these all this operators, take this whole thing, act it on phi equals 0. Now, in the Klein-Gordon equation, these two terms have exactly the same sign. And that's not the case here. So this is not the Klein-Gordon equation. This is something different. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, that often happens to me. I certainly don't know what these phase kind of things are. Uh, I'm pretty sure nobody uses them. <laughs> they kind of like this constant thing showing up. Uh, this is just a little bit more complicated, but it's well-defined. And that's my biggest defense out there is I say, well, it's it's well defined, therefore nature probably uses it. We we don't use it today, but that is the limitation of uh, what we've done so far. Um, so anyway, uh, what makes it relativistic is all those terms are being filled in. Okay, and so if, again, if we call this whole darn thing, uh, ooh, use that letter. Um, multiply it by its conjugate, then what we end up with is this sort of thing. And um, this will be the kind of thing that you can connect to experiment because it's not this probability amplitude, it's, it's the actual probability of finding a particle in a particular situation in a particular time. All right? So now we've got the complete set of mathematical rules for making, for figuring out where something belongs in the map of physics. So the mathematical rules are, if you write everything out as a quaternion collection of operators, if there are any constants in there, or if time is not being treated exactly the way space is, then you're in classical physics. And I should say there's probably gradations of this sort of thing. Newton was as classical as you can be. He <laughs> had three zeros. Uh, but if you have just one, it'll be less kind of classical, uh, semi, semi-classical or something like that. Um, if you fill out everything, you're relativistic. And then for quantum mechanics versus non-quantum mechanics, you say to connect to experiment, do you have to take a norm? If the answer is yes, then you're in the domain of quantum mechanics. If the answer is no, then you're not in quantum mechanics. Just that simple. All right. Thank you very much.